Imagine with me a place, a place where there's no more crying, no more pain, no more night. Imagine what it's going to be to see the glory of God forever shining. Imagine seeing Jesus face to face. Imagine what it will be like when Jesus comes again. Well, good morning, everyone. <coughs> Thank you for the beautiful special music. Makes us think about a time when there will be no more war. 
But I've entitled that this morning, my, my remarks, because we're in war. Do you believe that? In this world, there are so many forms of war, but I have a specific type of war that I want to talk with you about today, and it relates itself to young people. And so my remarks are going to be toward you as young people, but we as adults certainly can gain from it. You see what's happening up there? People are going away from us. And I just want you to know that before many of your peers reach the age of 20, they're going to leave the church. Over 50% are going to walk out the door. Does that concern you? That's a major challenge that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is facing. And I would like to talk with you about this battle, this war. Why are they leaving? Well, there are a lot of reasons, I think. But in particular, I'm going to touch on this one here. There's a battle between good and evil going on. Would you agree? And it's interesting that of all places, this began in heaven. Do you realize that? The first war that ever took place took place in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth how much? All of us. He's very successful at that. He's the best con man that has ever existed. If you think you're good at sales, you haven't even begun. He is so good that he talked a third of the angels out of the very presence of God. Do you realize that? You have to be really good at what you do to talk a third of the angels out of the presence of God in a perfect environment. He also was successful enough that he talked our first parents out of the Garden of Eden. And that began the challenge for us here on earth. What is this all about, though? Because, you see, it's interesting. In heaven, they didn't have machine guns. They didn't have bombers. They didn't have a nuclear weapon. The battle was for the mind. Satan talked a third of the angels out of heaven. And he's been working on us ever since. Satan invents unnumbered schemes to occupy our minds that they may not dwell upon the very work with which we ought to be best acquainted. He knows that with him, how much? How much? Everything. Everything. It is the whole ball game. Any war, any frustrations, any anger, whatever. It all relates itself to what goes on up here in human beings. So everything depends on his diverting minds from Jesus and his truth. And he has a myriad of ways to do that. Proverbs 23, 7. What a man thinks in his heart... How does that finish? So is he. So whatever goes on up here, that's who you are. You may fool a few people, but you'll never fool yourself. You know what it's like, what's going on in your head. Satan is battling for your mind. What? a challenge in this day and age. You folks are surrounded every day. Now, I'll tell you this. You might be frustrated a little bit up here because you don't have all the, I don't know, like necessities, I guess, of the world here. Uh, certain type of cell phone, I understand. Uh, some controlled access to the Internet. But you know what? 
That's a good thing. And when I'm done, I think you'll agree. But in the world, as a whole, we are surrounded. From the time young people get up <laughs> until the time they go to sleep at night. And whether you're here in this little haven on earth or other places, Satan is hammering at your brain. Everywhere you look in this world, people are wanting to control how you think. All the commercials, any article you read, everybody has an angle. Talk about screen time nowadays. It's not just computers, it's screen time, right? Now, I dare say that your screen time is limited here to a degree. And I will say that you're blessed because of that. Uh, I, I see advertisements on the television all the time now. In fact, lawyers have grabbed a hold of it. People are so involved with their technology that driving down the road, they've got to be doing texting. And now the lawyers are saying, hey, if you've been hit by somebody who is texting, we can help you out. We can help get you some money. Technology is something that people live with. But I dare say that there's enough concern from your folks and your teachers that they, they care about how you deal with this. But you notice, you, you see the two bottom pictures there? Have you ever seen a little baby playing with an iPad or a phone? Do they get it? They know how to do that, right? I mean, an 18-month-old kid moving that thing around, tapping this, doing that, get to do what it wants to do. And many times, in fact, I would say most times, parents have no clue what their kids are doing on their computers. While I say computers nowadays, it's no longer computers. Everybody has one of these, right? Well, I get it. I understand. But <laughs> out there, everybody has one of these. I can go anywhere I want to go in the world on this little device right here. I think there's enough concern that parents need to wake up. And then there's music. I love music. This song today was inspiring to me. What was Satan in heaven? What was one of his roles? Choir director. Choir director. Do you think he knows about music? Do you think he knows how it impacts people's lives? How it moves them? Can you imagine how many billions and billions of dollars have been made from selling music? It's because... It's such a, an integral part of us as human beings. God created us to love music. But you watch a lot of young people today, and I move around all the time. I, like I say, I spend 200 days a year on the road, going through airports and walking through the mall and whatever. And it's kind of interesting that I, I see things now that's a little bit different. I mean, when I have my earbuds in, I want them both in because I want to block other things out. I want to hear my music. But it's interesting to see kids down the street now. They have only one end. The other thing's dangling around down here doing whatever, you know. I'm not sure I understand that, that they only have one earpiece in, but they're focused somehow on the music. But do you think Satan uses music to impact how we think? <laughs> have you ever been, I'll use the word, in a funk feeling yucky, and you put on the music that you think is going to help you. Music impacts how we feel, right? Average kid today spends seven and a half hours of screen time every day. And they actually experience about ten and a half hours. Now, I recognize 
that uh, it's a little different here, and I'm grateful for that. And one of these days, you probably will be too. But a typical young person today, when they get up, what do you think the first thing is that they do? What do they do? Check their phone? Yeah. And, and what do they do? Call somebody? Yeah, that's, and that's a mystery to me. You know, I'll text you about twice and I'm calling. I'm done with the texting thing. But they're texting to see who's up and around and what they're doing and whatnot. And then all of a sudden it occurs to them, wow, I didn't finish my homework. So they're over there doing their homework on their computer while they're texting a little bit over here and the television's on and they have an earbud in listening to music while they're doing all this. And I describe that many times to people, and they're all going, yep, that's it. That's right. That's how they get ten and a half hours in. But that's outside of school time, by the way. Outside of school time. You all spent till midnight last night in prayer. There are a lot of times that people are spending way longer than that on their phones texting back and forth and watching movies and doing whatever. That's how they get their screen time in. Battle for the mind. And I found out that by the time the average American kid reaches the age 18, they've watched 17,000 hours of television, at least. That's about an average of three and a half hours a day, and and I used to think that Seventh-day Adventist young people wouldn't spend that much time watching television, but I think I've kind of given up on that. I mean, if you go to the average home, in reality, if you go to the average home, there's a television in the living room. There's one in most every bedroom. In fact, you know, they've got them in the kitchen now, you know, attached to a cabinet there. You can keep on, you know, want to watch the news, of course. Everywhere you go, there's a television in the house. And then you have the movies. But I'll spend a little bit of time on these television programs, actually. I don't know if you've seen these, heard of these, uh, watched the commercials or whatever, and they, they probably are all outdated now, I don't know. I've spent my whole life updating all these things. But my point is, the devil finds his way into the home directly and is able to work his magic. Because you see today, superheroes is so important. The haunted. You hear about all these kind of things all the time, right? That's where it's at. Everybody wants to have superpowers. I was in a hotel in Atlanta one time, and I, I watched this commercial, and this individual was saying, if you have had a loved one pass away, and you would like to communicate with them, call this number, and we will connect you with them on television. It's a foregone conclusion in many people's minds, that connection with the dead is possible. And he'd bring it right into their own home. Maybe you've read The Great Controversy in Ellen White where it says, when a couple of things have happened, when it reaches across the gulf, and it was talking about Satanism, spiritualism, it's here, full-blown, in people's homes if they want it, or on their cell phones. Hollywood is clear about the battle for the mind also. A friend of mine, Dr. Gene Brewer, goes to these brain conferences where they tell all about how the brain works and what impacts people and what makes them do this, that, and the other thing. And he was at one of these brain conferences, and during a break, there was this individual that uh, began a conversation, and you know how you have small talk, what do you do, where are you from, and all that kind of thing. This individual happened to be an executive 
from Hollywood. Hollywood, why are you, what are you doing at a brain conference? You know what he said? We want to know how people think. We want them to come to our movies. We want to know how to appeal to them. Now, I'm not sure. I suppose they really may care a little bit about how people think, but I think it's only because they want to get to this. They want you to come to their movie. And, uh, you know, every time you turn around, and like I say, these are outdated, I'm sure, by many years. Because every day, it seems like there's a new movie that you have to see, right? And so they're trying to sell you on coming to this movie, and now they have all these great activities that they do to celebrate these people that acted the part so well, and they get these Grammys and these... All these other kind of things. Maybe it's not a Grammy, it's an Oscar or something. Anyway, it's one of those kind of things. They want you to come to see their movies. A battle for your mind. Have you ever heard of Generation Me? Anybody here heard of Generation Me? A few of you. Well, I want to tell you that you are living in Generation Me. And in fact, um, I wanted to do a little research, and lo and behold, I found a book entitled Generation Me. Why today's young Americans are more what? Confident, assertive, entitled, and more miserable than ever before. Now that's a conundrum, isn't it? Did a little research in, uh, when I read the book, and uh, this book covers six decades, 60 years, involving 1.3 million people, showing how this country successfully developed Generation Me. We've worked hard at it. We really have. To help everybody believe that I'm entitled, whether I have done anything or not, It's all about me. The author says, today's young people speak the language of self as their native tongue. Do you believe that? I'll give you an example. Way back in the dark ages when I was in school, if I said me and Johnny, I would be in trouble. It's always Johnny and me. Well, nowadays it's not. It's me and Johnny. Sorry about you, Johnny. You're second. I'm first. Would you agree? I mean, is that what you hear today now? The language of Generation Me. The individual has always come first, and feeling good about yourself has always been the primary virtue. And there's something else that, that we do today that helps with the language of Generation Me. You know, we're always, always doing this. We may include somebody else in here, but it's really called a selfie, right? I want to make sure I get myself in there, background, whatever. Saw somebody who was at the uh, inauguration. Here I am. In fact, they were on the plane, and Jimmy Carter was flying on the plane. He was shaking the, Jimmy Carter's hand and getting a selfie at the same time. Okay, whatever. But, you know, Generation Me. They are not self-absorbed. They're self-important. If you don't believe it, just ask. Generation Me, alive and well today. Dr. Twin says, The society that molds you when you are young stays with you the rest of your life. And I agree with that. The society that molds you. you. You are fortunate to a degree that you're shielded somewhat up here from Generation Me. And I've witnessed that when you go out and you do your disaster response and uh, when you're up front here and your interaction with one another. 
I believe you get it more than many others as young people, and I'm grateful for that. Steps to Christ says, the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. That battle that takes place right here. Have you ever fought that battle? Maybe you've had that fight today already. I'm going to ask some of y'all to help me with the reading. I don't know if y'all can see that up there, but would somebody read that for me? When do you think that was written? I think it was early 1900s, the book of education was written, but I'm not sure. Maybe it was in the 1800s. But if she wrote that today, if she were alive today, what do you think she would say? I think there would be red words up there just like I put them. Never before in the history of the world have people been hammered the way Satan is hammering us today. And I want to say it takes three entities to help young people like you succeed in this battle with self. The first one, right here. What does this demonstrate to you? Yes, worship at home, right? It all starts right there. And then the school. Where Jesus Christ is invited every day. And then in the church. You folks are blessed because those three entities agree here. Your parents would not have sent you here had they not believed and set a foundation so that you could come to a place like this and have it furthered. And then you folks are the church. Now, when you go back home, it probably is a little different. I hope they use you back home. I really do. But I don't know. When you go back to your church at home, do they invite you to do special music or do they invite you to be a part of the church service? Something to think about. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart. I'm pretty sure it's not thinking about that thing that's beating in your chest right now talking about your mind. Guard your mind above all else, for it determines the course of your life. What you think determines what you do and the decisions you make. And I want to tell you that the con man is really, really, I mean, really good at what he does. And I'm going to give you some examples. Who made this statement? I believe today that my conduct is in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator. I know there could probably be lots of individuals. But in your wildest dreams, would you ever have thought it would have been this individual? He made that statement. And then... Just putting these words up here, I think probably you all have heard about Newtown, Connecticut. Have you not? You remember Newtown, Connecticut? Some of you are shaking your head. Maybe those pictures will help conjure up something in your mind. And I asked myself, what would cause a young man like this to take a weapon like that and shoot a beautiful child like that, point blank range. 
What would possess an individual? We know the answer to that. The devil won the battle in that one. And then Solomon. Solomon, to me, is the second wisest man that ever lived. Would you agree? Who was the first? Yes, of course. But you know what? Satan played him like a puppet. And here's something that I had never realized until I read this statement. He who in his early reign had displayed so much wisdom and sympathy in restoring a helpless babe to its unfortunate mother fell so low as to consent to the erection of an idol to whom living children were offered as sacrifices. He approved of that. He gave his approval. He may not have said, I'm okay with that, but if you don't do something about it, you've approved it, right? Sometimes inaction is just a great at approval as doing something. Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately wicked. Our own hearts. This is something that to me was amazing. Our own mind will deceive us quicker and more often than Satan will. All he does is start us down the pathway and we take it from there. Now, if we start to stray back, he certainly is going to work on us to get us back again. But our own minds, after 6,000 years, will deceive us quicker and more often than Satan will. Somebody who could talk a third of the angels out of heaven, who talked our first parents out of the Garden of Eden, who is so subtle, who hammers us all day, every day, what hope is there for you as young people? What hope is there for us, but particularly as you growing up? I mean... This right here, I take with me pretty much wherever. That's how I do my business. But young people have it wherever they go. If all of those things are true, what hope is there? Patriarchs and prophets says it is a law of the human mind that by beholding we become changed. Those things that we spend time with those things that we internalize make us up who we are. Could somebody read this for me, please? Isn't that something? The evils without will awaken the evils within. You may not have even known that was there. It might have been passed on to you from generation before. What we see, what we hear, all those things. So is it possible today... For you as young people to hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. Is it even possible? Yes. I want to tell you about what you all told us. Have you ever heard of the study Value Genesis? Some of you might have. If you have not heard about it, you can actually Google it. There's a website, and you can go on and see what young people have told the church about their relationship with God, their relationship with the church, and it's pretty compelling. But the young people told us in those 
studies, and we've done three of them. The largest study done by any church, probably 30 to 50,000 young people each time took those surveys. You folks told us if my home, my school, and my church work effectively together, if those three agree, if they work together as a team, there's a 99% probability I will have an intrinsic faith in Jesus. Do you know what intrinsic means? Built in. Built in. It's who you are. It's a part of you. So if my home, my church, and school all work together, that's how we can gain this victory through Jesus Christ. Counsels to parents, teachers, and students. Somebody else read that for me, please. Only the power of God can save our children from being swept away by the tide of evil. The responsibility resting upon parents, teachers, and church members to do their part in cooperation with God is greater than words can express. Those three entities working together. Now, you folks probably don't know what this is. Young people. Do you, any of you young people know what that is? What is it? All right, it's three-legged stool. What did they use it for back in the day? You probably have never used it. Yeah, well, time out. That could be a good one for it. Actually, it was used for milking cows. You nailed it, huh? Okay, good. Well, I would liken you folks to that. The home, the school, and the church supporting and providing that environment to develop an intrinsic faith in Jesus. Now, what do you think would happen if one of those legs were removed? Probably would hit the ground. Difficult to stay up on two of those legs. In fact, pretty much impossible. I'm just going to go through these quickly with you. Let's take a look at the home. Too much importance cannot be placed on the early training of children. The lessons that the child learns during the first seven years of life have more to do with forming his character than how much? Than all that it learns in future years. That's the foundation right there. Starts at the home. The influence of carefully guarded Christian home in the years of childhood and youth is what? The surest safeguard against the corruptions of this world. Starting right there at the home, the foundation. Have you ever heard of George Barna? He's a big researcher, does research on a lot of things related to the church and how people stay in the church and how the church affects people and so on. But this is what he said. By age 13, a child has developed the value system they will die with. Do you agree with that? Is that biblical? I see this, and I, is that biblical? Anybody want to venture to that biblical? Why? Why is it biblical? Yeah. Okay. But there's also even something in the Jewish economy is what I'm going to call it. What happened at age 12? He became a man. So that's biblical to me. The foundation has been set. You are who you are. And only by the grace of God can you change after that. If you have wandered away or if you stay close to God, that is how that happens. But the foundation is set. How do parents develop Seventh-day Adventist value system in their children? Well, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. Anybody know that? As soon as I start down it, you'll get it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. How often is that? That's pretty much all the time, isn't it? 
So that was his direction to us through Moses. God says, this is how you're going to do it. If you really want to make it happen, this is how you do it. It is a 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, evangelistic series in the home. That's what it is. It's role modeled. It's talked about. It's prayed for. It happens all the time. We'll take a look at the school. I say to parents today, if it's a battle for the mind, then it matters where your kid attends school. I mean, really, if you think about it, your teachers are paid to influence how you think. That's their job. Am I right? Isn't that what they're paid to do? They're to teach you things that are going to influence how you think. So why would individuals believe that they could send their kid down the street five days a week for six hours and have them not be influenced? And we already know Satan is subtle in how he works, right? And many times all he has to do is get us started down the pathway and we take it from there. Here's something that was very to me, a very big blessing to understand. They, teachers, are co-workers with the angels. Rather, they are the human agencies through whom the angels accomplish their mission. Angels speak through their voices and work by their hands. What a huge challenge. Every day to be that avenue that God can work through to influence young people. But that's, that's how it works in Christian schools. And you have teachers that pray for you and pray with you. The story is told about an elementary school teacher who had been in the same location pretty much her whole career. And she was retiring, and all of these individuals were coming together, and they were going to celebrate her retirement. And there were doctors, and there were lawyers, and there were teachers, and there were farmers, and there were homemakers, and all of these individuals, and many of them attributed a lot of their success to that little lady. And they said, what is it? What did you do that was able to have all of these individuals say the things they say about you. And her comment was, you know, I don't know that I can say anything specific, but she said, I do know one thing. I came every day to school early enough that I could stand before the desk of every child and lift them up to Jesus Christ. Now, if they didn't do one more thing, would that be significant in itself? Teachers that pray with and for their children. Somebody read this for me, please. The way the new Christian school has been aimed to prepare us <coughs> and educate and prepare the children for this time is for us. Nothing is great, nothing is of greater importance than the education of our children. Did you see that? Nothing is of greater importance. Now, I didn't say that's the most important thing, but it says nothing is of more importance than the education of our children and young people. That's why Heritage Academy exists, to influence young people for Jesus Christ. It's a place where individuals will help you discover what God would have you to do. It's a place where the Lord touched my heart to help me understand the importance of serving Him. And I had two individuals that I can think of in particular that influenced my life. Growing up, when I was, a, actually I attended Fletcher Academy for the first two years. 
I was one of those pain in the neck village kids. And they never asked me to leave school. The principal did call me in a time or two and suggest that there might be other schools to go to. <laughs> in fact, one day I was out in the yard and my dad came home and, and came out and said, Son, have you thought about going to boarding school? And I said, No, but it sounds like I need to start. Well, they sent me to Blue Mountain Academy. Some of you might have been there before. And it was the turning point in my life. A school of 450 kids. And I have no earthly idea what possessed this English teacher, whose name, by the way, was Darwin Charles Heisey. Not Charles Darwin, but Darwin Charles. He selected me to be a part of the circuit riding preachers group. I, that would have been the last thing in my mind that I ever would have thought to sign up for. And he sought me out and said, I want you to be a part of circuit riding preachers. Well, how do you say no to that? <laughs> and so that helped influence me. And then the physical education teacher out of all those kids, I got on the gymnastics team. And that helped change my life as well. I began to realize there's something more than Generation Me. It made a difference. I began to realize that God had a calling for me. And while I was there, I decided I was going to be a Navy chaplain. Well, the Lord rerouted me, as you can tell. But I went back... And all those guys I used to hang out with, they said, what's happened to you? You're not the same. I don't know. Those things aren't important anymore. School made a difference for me. It's a 180-day evangelistic series every year. At the office, we have our meetings with all the directors around the Southern Union. And they have these evangelistic reports that they do. How many souls and so on that were baptized. And I every time have to say, well, you know, we've started another 180-day evangelistic series in about 170 schools around the Southern Union. And young people are baptized every year as a result. And for some reason, it occurs to them, Wow, that's true. But that's what it's all about, to help you realize there's something more than what this world has to offer. Value Genesis. There's clear evidence that the longer our children remain in Seventh-day Adventist schools, the more likely it is that they will stay in the church. If you stay in education all the way through college, that's even the best. But even through grade 12, that helps set the foundation along with what has begun at home. Well, we have one last one to look at, and it's called the church. Counsels to parents, teachers, and students. Somebody read that for me, please. That's a pretty strong indictment, isn't it? God has appointed the church as a what? A watchman. Do you know what happens in the military if you go to sleep and you're on watch? They shoot you, right? Why? Why do we really care if the watchman falls asleep? <laughs> Everyone's life is at risk. Absolutely. That's a huge responsibility. And yet, she says, they have failed to give the warning because they're asleep. Over 50% of our young people are leaving the church. Wow. Most of you probably have not heard of Tony Campolo. Some of the adults might have. He is a Christian sociologist. And he decided that he would make a trip back to the old stomping grounds, which happened to be in Philadelphia. 
And he was wandering around the community, and when he was there, he found his old church. And this is what he found. It was all boarded up. And he began to ask a question. Why do churches die? What makes them go away like that? And so he was able to gain access to the church. And as he wandered through the church, he found this file cabinet. And he pulled out the drawers and he found that it was the records of the baptisms and so on of the church. And so he went to the year when he was baptized and he pulled out this slip of paper and this is what he found. There were only three conversions in the previous 12 months and they were just children. That's how it was phrased. They were just children. And he goes, just children? Are you kidding me? I'm one of those. One served as a missionary for years in Africa. The other became a seminary president. I dedicated myself to Christian higher education. How many thousands of people do you think they influenced? Those, just those three kids. Well, he felt like he had his answer as to why that church died. Because they had the mindset They were just kids, just children. That was their problem. Now, I'm going to point out to you as young people that we in the Seventh-day Adventist Church have similar symptoms. Are you aware of that? And I'll try to clarify that for you. Do you know the average age of the Seventh-day Adventist membership in the United States? You're close. It may have risen since then, but that was a number I had at the moment, 58. Now, I mentioned that I was planning to retire in 67, so 58 really isn't all that, you know what I mean? But when you look at the average age of a church, that's problematic, wouldn't you think? What does that indicate to you if the average age is 58? Yeah. Well, here's another one. There are 1,000 churches in the United States that have no children. Now, if you just do the math, you have 1,000 churches, you have 50 states, how many churches per state have no children? 20? Is that good math? Yeah. So 20 churches in the state of Tennessee have no children. And you know what the criteria was? There are not enough young people to have a Sabbath school. Now I ask you, how many young people does it take for Sabbath school? Yeah, one. So that means there are no children, right? That's problematic. So if you you look at the equation, if the average age for the church is 58, and you have 1,000 churches with no children and over 50% of our youth are leaving the church, that equals a challenged and dying church when you really think about it. Now, that's here in the U.S. You look at the rest of the world, and they get it. When you go on a mission trip, have you ever noticed the difference between here and there? Have you ever noticed the difference in their uh, church services and when they sing and so on? Now, you folks sing here very well. But... You go to some other churches, not so much. And the people are happy, am I right? They don't have two cents to rub together almost, and yet they're happy. And when I've taken kids down, they go, I don't get it. They have nothing, and they're happy. And they end up going, you know what? I'm never complaining again. I see what these people have. And I want that. I've seen them leave their whole suitcase almost to help people out. They begin to understand. What can be done about this challenge? Well, can you finish this for me? Use them or lose them. 
I am so thankful that you folks are the church here. You folks are the ones that do the different parts that need to be done. Now, not to say that adults don't preach now and then and do their thing, but you guys are the church. That's a huge blessing. But if you go to other churches, not so much. When I sign up to play on a softball team, I don't sign up to do that. Would you agree? I mean, you signed up to play. I don't sign up to ride the pine. But, you know, in the church, there's a little perk. You know, God just doesn't quite have enough to get it out there and play, actually, and so he's sitting there on the bench. Well, you stay on the bench in our church because their talents are not recognized or used. You guys are loaded with talent. I go to schools and I am blown away with what I see and I say, I cannot understand people's mindset. If they've ever seen young people perform, if they've ever seen them interact and go to their classes, that they would ever question the value of Seventh-day Adventist education. Just blows my mind. But our kids sit on the pine. You know, I, I go and I preach a similar sermon to this to a church and the kids are in the balcony and the saints are down on the floor. And I'm going, are you kidding me? Well, what can churches do? I talked about Spencerville, or Spencer, right near you, and what happens right here. But you look at those ages, 11, 12, 16, 14, this is their nominating committee list. Church clerk, 18, and so on. Maybe you even know some of these people. I don't know. Youth activities director, 20. It's probably advantageous to keep up with the kids. But, you know, you look at all that. They get it. They understand it. I want to say to you, you folks can save churches. I talked to you. I told you that story last night, right, about the Fletcher Academy seniors whining and complaining about wanting their own church. But you know what? They stepped up, took care of business. That little church is almost like the church they went to for three years, Sabbath after <laughs> Sabbath, and they carried that church through. You want to see what the church looks like now? That's it. A beacon on the hill there in Brevard, North Carolina. 75 plus members. Debt free. Because young people filled the gap. So, I might ask this question, and I do, of the church members. What are your hopes, your dreams, your prayers for your children? I'm sure they would answer to have them find their place in God's work and to be welcomed by Jesus into God's kingdom. That's our hope and prayer for you as young people and for us as well. And, and people ask many times, well, what can I do? Here's what I tell them, and maybe you can help me and, and let me know if I'm right here. I'm going to go back to that. I tell them, find two young people in your church and get to know their name. And welcome them to church every Sabbath. I mean, if somebody came up to you and said, and what's your name? Abby. Abby, I'm glad you're here at church today. Glad you're going to be with us to worship. How would that make you feel? Happy. Happy, yeah. Feel like, hey. Somebody noticed I'm alive. Somebody I didn't even know. They welcomed me to church. So if they did that Sabbath after Sabbath, and you didn't show up one Sabbath, and you came the next one, hey, where were you? I missed you. Isn't it nice to be missed? Do you know that there was a town, a small town, that they were having problems with their kids, getting in trouble all the time, and, and so they were saying, well, what can we do? They made a decision. We're going to get to know the names of every kid in this whole town, and we're going to make them feel a part of this town. You know what happened? K 
kids started staying in school. Problems went down drastically. They started graduating and becoming successful individuals just because somebody got to know their name. I'm important enough that somebody remembers my name. Well, our text today, don't copy the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by what? Changing the way you think. That's it, my friends. The battle is up here. And I submit to you that Jesus Christ is coming soon. Would you agree? So I say, prepare yourselves and let us prepare our children. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to lift up these young people here to you today, asking that you would touch their hearts and help them to realize that Heritage Academy is here for them. May they realize your calling in their lives. I pray that you would be with each of the teachers, the administrators, the staff members, as they interact with these young people, that they can be a blessing to them. I thank you for this sacred ground where your presence exists. And I pray that your guardian angels will be here in such great numbers as Satan and his angels cannot work that the lives of these young people might be able to be touched by you in a greater way than ever before, and that we can all be in your kingdom as a result. I pray. Amen.